Um, we are doing non-technical introductions at this talk, and it would be difficult to fully enumerate the technical contributions of Jitendra anyway. Um, and so the non-technical int introduction, one thing that personally has, uh, that I've, I have a deep level of respect for Jitendra is his commitment to the scientific method. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, Jitendra was famously skeptical about deep learning along the years, uh, but it takes a certain amount of uh, commitment to the scientific method uh, to not be entrenched in your views, evaluate evidence as it comes in, uh, change your, your views, and lead the next generation of work. And so for that, I think many of us are, are grateful. Um, and today, Jitendra will be talking about how to write a good paper. Please. Thank you. OK, can you he hear me in the back? Yeah, yeah, I have this, this mic so I can talk, talk about. OK, rule number one. If you want to write a good paper, what's the most important thing? Rule number one is, first you must do good research. Because if you don't have anything, there's this old saying, right? You can make, you can make bad wine from good grapes, but you cannot make good wine from bad grapes. So if you don't have a good grapes, you are sunk. So rule number one is, first do good research. OK, but let's take that as a given. So in the rest of the talk, I'm not, I'm assuming that. Okay, how to write a good paper. So what I'm going to do is actually to pick on some advice which uh, Don Geeman gives his students because it's reasonably consistent with the advice that I give my students. So I'm uh, going to take you through that. Okay, so he said, so a paper has four parts, a title, an abstract, an introduction, and the rest of the paper and you should spend equal time on all these four parts, okay? Now, this will undoubtedly come as a disappointment to the students because the rest of the paper is what they have toiled for the last uh, six months, one year, two years, whatever. But in the writing phase uh, is what I'm talking about. We are, as I said in the beginning, we are presuming that you have done good research and we are now talking about how best to communicate it. So think hard about each of these stages. Okay, and that's what I'm gonna do. Title, abstract, introduction, and the rest of the paper. Ah, okay, title. So I think I, it, with, with all the papers from our group, I spend a lot of time thinking about the title. Because the title should evoke the key concepts of the paper, it should be memorable, and it should be memorable five years later, ten years later. So the kind of, of titles which could equally well apply to some other paper in your field, those are not good titles. For example, a deep learning approach to object recognition, if you were writing a paper in 2006, that would have been an interesting title. It would have been a novel title. It would have made your paper stand out from the crowd. But a deep learning approach to object recognition used in 2018 is a very foolish title because it doesn't stand out. The, you should have, think about it in terms of, we are scientists, right? Think about it in terms of the conditional entropy. So given the title, which papers, so play the following game. Take all the titles of CBPR papers and then take the papers and let's do cross matching. Can this title work on this paper? And if your title can fit on 50 of the papers in the conference, then it's a bad title, okay? So spend some time on that. Uh, another remark is spend some time coming up with the terms. I genuinely believe that my main contribution to all the papers that my group, group has produced has been in the, in, the, in the terms. So I remember arguing with Pietro who wanted to use the term adaptive diffusion and I said, no, 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 we should use anisotropic diffusion. I remember arguing with, uh, with uh, Gianbo about normalized cuts and so forth. And why, why anisotropic diffusion and not adaptive diffusion? Because every damn thing is adaptive, every paper which is on this topic, you have to try to find a way that your term captures what is special about, about your, your idea, your insight and so forth, and then it will be memorable. It will be memorable five years later, 10 years later, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Okay, 
opening lines. Okay, this is something which is really something that, uh, that, that students struggle with. So typically what they will do is, I've, this is my canonical experience. Okay, you, you send out a student, he or she is trying to write their paper, they're gonna struggle for three hours and then they will come up with this opening sentence. Object recognition is an important problem in computer vision, okay? And it always happens. All students do this and then they take three hours over it. So, so this, this, is, this, is, this is not good, okay? So, uh, so first of all, I have advice for advisors. So I'm going to go meta. So there's my advice for students and then I think I've been in the business long enough that now I can advise advisors. So rule number one, when you're writing a paper, don't subject your student to this, right? Because at the end you'll have to throw that away and start again. So what I tell my, uh, what I do is with my students, we stand, spend, let's say half an hour, one hour, trying to think about the story, right? What's the paper about? What's the contribution? What's the most important, what's the important storyline? Once we have done that, then we try to decompose the paper into the sections, okay, introduction, related work, you know, the description of the approach, experiments, and so forth. And then I tell the student, go off and write section, uh, from sections two onwards. Because if you ask them to start on section one, they're gonna spend all their time and they'll just, they'll not put pen to paper and when you, they'll put pen to paper, it'll come out with such gems as object recognition is an important problem in computer vision, okay? Now, what should be our aim? Uh, we, we should really aspire to sort of really catchy opening lines, right? So for me, the standard is this, right? So the, the opening lines from literature, right? Now, of course, is David Forsyth in the room? Okay, David Forsyth is in the room, okay. Other than David Forsyth, let's start with, it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Okay, which, which is the novel that begins this? Pride and Prejudice. Okay, the second one. It was the best of times, the worst of times. Tale of Two Cities. As Gregor Samsa woke one morning, metamorphosis. Lolita, okay, that's easy. <laughs> uh, call me Ishmael, Moby Dick. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Tolstoy. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the, golf, in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. Which was? The old man in the sea. Okay. So what's beautiful about these lines is that they actually, they each of them capture something about the, the novel, right? I mean, they, they are memorable because, uh, because they, are, they are quite intimately connected to the story. So that's what we want. Our opening lines, now okay, I mean, we are not all going to become, uh, you know, prize winning authors and so forth. And this is really the high end of the business. There are, there are much more, uh, our, our aspirations should be high, but we should, the perfect is the enemy of the good. You know, you settle for, for something less than that. But think about this. They don't, they didn't start with object recognition is an important <laughs> problem in computer vision. Okay, so, okay. Uh, introduction. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the most important section of a paper. And I will give you, uh, I, I, I will reveal one secret. For me, when I read a paper, when I'm reviewing or in any setting, I basically, after I've finished reading the introduction, I know whether I like it or not. Okay, an introduction should really make the case. The rest of the paper is to back up the claims made in the introduction. But really, the introduction, by the time you're finished reading the introduction, you should know what the whole story is about. What is your contribution? What is the problem you tackled? Why was it worth tackling? What was your clever insight, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't make that case in the introduction, then, uh, then, then you, have, you have lost the, the audience. You have deservedly lost the audience. Okay, now there are multiple styles possible. I don't want to push a style because just like with with writing novels, individuality is perfectly okay. I think, in, I, I in fact hate referees, like the famous referee too, because they will, they will cajole you and coerce you into abandoning your individuality, right? Uh, it's, it's okay to make 
make the introduction interesting and crisp and, and so forth. Okay. I will, I can, so I can only talk about what style works for me. I, I, I use two styles and my earlier, one is a historical style. The historical style is that you somehow are tracing through the, the, the complexities of a problem. So you are, you are talking about, okay, let's say we are talking about perceptual organization and grouping. So I'll, I'll start with, you know, Max Wertheimer said, uh, or made some observations about visual inputs and so on and so forth. So you, you, that historical context is supposed to create that need. You, you see that, okay, we have, we have made this progress, but it is obvious that there is a clear hole, that there's a clear gap, there is this burning need. And then, then there's a resolution. You're setting it up, right? It's like, you're, the setup then is that you have there's some intuition, some insight. You need to try to communicate that intuition and or insight that you had, and you want to convey it in sort of informal terms, and then you get into the technical details of how you used SVMs or neural networks or whatever, uh, and then of course the experiments and so forth. So that's, that's one style. A second style is what I call figure one, figure two. So figure one is what you did, figure two is how you did it. I mean, in computer graphics, this, this style is very common. So figure one is kind of like your, a, a nice figure which sort of indicates the input and output of your system. So you make it very clear to the audience what you did. And then figure two is how you did it. So it might be an architecture of your approach or something schematic. So, I, the, the, so this, this style works for me, but I don't want to advocate this as universally the right approach. Now, of course, I mean, I, I gave this advisory perspective of what are the important sections of the paper. There is the rest of the paper. I don't have anything substantial to say because I'm sure Bill Freeman and others would have said it. I wanted to focus on what I thought would be redundant. Good, good advice here is good writing follows from good reading. So th this is as true in, you know, like English literature as it is in computer vision. Read papers of people whom you respect or papers which you liked and read them multiple times, of course. But once you're past understanding them technically, read them for style, right? I mean, when you, you, you read, you can read Hemingway and get Hemingway style. You can read Dickens and you can get Dickens style. So you read a paper from some author and you will see their style. And you will find that if you look at, see how they are solving the problem of how to express content, and I think that will give you insight. Other sections of the paper, the, 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 the paper which is on the approach, you need to be clear and you need to put your code out so people can replicate. So there the answer is very clear. The goal is replication. In terms of experiments, the, it's very clear we want baselines and we want ablation studies. Again, study people who do this well. Like, I'll pick somebody who, who I think is a very good experimentalist, uh, Ross Kershik. You read Ross Kershik's papers and you will see this, uh, the, this, this sequence of, uh, uh, these are the baselines, these are the ablation studies, and, and I, I must say that overall our field has improved. It used to, I mean, we never used to do baselines, we never used to do ablation studies, we all had our separate images on which we found convenient results. I think I'm going to end here and uh, I think, Oh yeah, I forgot my last slide. This is on figures and tables. These are very important, and, uh, and, and here's a good way to judge the value of figures and, and tables. And, and I make all my students do this. Once the paper has been written, I make them pull out all the, all the figures and tables and put them on slide one, two, three, four, and then, then I have a talk ready. So it's their job to have such good figures that I can give a talk without doing any work by just uh, copying all the, all the figures and tables from the paper. But this tells you what is needed, right? So the figures must in themselves tell the story. And then my last advice here is the best way to write a paper is to first give a talk. Because what happens is that in a, we, are, we are always trying to figure out the story, right? So the introduction is an attempt to figure out a story. A talk is another way to figure out a story. And when you give a talk, you're forced to make it a linear narrative which is interesting 
and which communicates the essence of your contribution. Once you have done that, it makes it easier to write. So writing a talk uh, and writing a paper, the two of them really go hand in hand. That's all. Thanks. We have time for some questions. Yeah. This to be a little controversial. What's the correlation of good um, best papers to this uh, style that you've talked about? Correlation of best papers, meaning uh, best, best paper, paper awards? awards? Uh, oh, uh, nothing. I mean, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think, uh, I, I mean, honestly, uh, the, the, uh, we, we are mere cogs in a machine, right, in the process of science. And uh, the best test is the test of time, right? And uh, in the immediate uh, moment, it is very difficult to judge the contributions of any work. So over time is, uh, is when, we, we, when we make the best judgment. So that's like a meta statement about all of science. I think uh, there is an effect of the, uh, so bringing it back to writing a paper, you have a, there is a big impact of the quality of writing on, on uh, whether your paper gets re read or not. If your paper is written in a confusing way, then it will not likely get read, and you may have made great contributions in there of which you will not get credit. Science is very good in terms of bad ideas are always thrown out and good ideas survive. So in long term, science is a very good process. It's really the best process we know for culling out bad ideas and promoting good ideas. Science is not necessarily good in terms of giving credit to the people who deserved it. Okay, that unfortunately, I wish I could say that always the right person will get credit and that's not quite true, okay? Uh, so the person who has a good exposition, who has a good uh, trumpet, who, who can uh, evangelize better, does have some advantage. Now, of course, we would, should want to correct it and really give credit where credit is due. And for which my advice, I, that can give me an opportunity to say this, look at all your, look at the list of citations in your paper and then figure out the median age of the paper cited. If that median age is two years, that means you have really not read the literature because all ideas have their genesis in the past and really trying to think about the, the, the credit that way is very important. You're doing that as an act of decency to all the researchers who have preceded you. And you should do that because you want yourself to get that credit in the future. Any other questions? Maybe I can ask one. Yeah. Uh, so do you, what advice do you give to your students in terms of timing? Uh, so a lot of these things take time. It's often, it, I presumably very difficult to come up with the right story when you're under, working under time pressures. In terms of concrete advice to students, what do you tell your group about when they must have a draft ready or a Oh, I, no, 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 there I can't, my group is not a good example. In terms of, <laughs> I, I know that the, the right approach is that they should have finished their paper two weeks in advance, okay? And, uh, but, uh, yeah, because so you are aspirational. Yeah, well, that you, is an aspiration, like? yeah. Uh, what, what, you know, I, what, what is important is to have this session. So, and this session you can have only after enough of the results are there. So what, what I really do emphasize is this, this one hour session where all the authors of the paper are there in front of a whiteboard and you, you iterate through what is your main contribution. You must figure out what's the main point of your paper. If your paper has three points, two of them are going to be lost, okay? And I figured this out uh, through experience. My earlier papers, I would thought, oh, I, I have made these, and, and then I would be annoyed that somebody else did not credit me for an idea which was there in, you know, footnote 17 on paragraph, from section three, paragraph line two, and so forth, right? And, and, and that line, no, you, you cannot blame people for not giving you credit for some ideas which were in passing, because if you didn't consider it important enough to make it the main point of your paper, why should somebody else, right? So if you have really have three big ideas, Write three papers. We have one, we'll take one last. Hi, thanks for the great talk. So is it, uh, I've heard rumors, but uh, is it true that uh, 
reviewers can uh, just look at the paper without reading it and tell whether the paper is good or not? <laughs> uh, well, though, though, I, I, if, if, they, if they can, huh? No. no, I think that's a. Yes. No, you, you can't. I, I can't. Yeah. I mean, I, look, if I know the authors of the paper and the title of the paper and I read the abstract, I will have priors. But, uh, but those priors should not count. They sh you should go by what? For papers, you should judge by the content of the paper. For proposals, you can judge by promise. But a paper is based on what did you produce there. My colleague's well-known modesty has prevented him from saying what he should have said, which is, I can't, and neither can you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's thank Jitendra okay. again. Thank you. All right, so if people can settle down. Um, our next speaker is uh, Cordelia Schmidt, who's a research director at INRIA. Um, we're doing informal intros, non-technical intros. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one, one of the things, uh, how about now? Okay. Does that work? Can you hear me now? So one of the things that uh, personally for me has always stood out about Cordelia's work in, is her insistence on thorough evaluation uh, when I was in, just starting out in grad school, there was a paper that had come out from Cordelia's group on uh, an, imp uh, an empirical comparison of different local interest point methods. Um, and it, it really was one of the earlier works that did uh, the often neglected and thankless job of running a thorough evaluation of everything that has been proposed in the literature to answer the simple basic question that we should sh all strive to answer, which is what works when. Um, and so that insistence hasn't, hasn't gone away. So we're looking forward to this talk on how to do good research and evaluation. Okay, fine. So this interaction fits perfectly my talk. So basically the talk is about how to do good research and evaluation. So actually I was thinking when I prepared my talk, it was closely related to Jenner's program. I'm glad it's not. So basically he, he was just about writing the paper and this is like the piece where you do the research, right? And so basically, so how to do research? Um, I mean, this is not, what, it's not doing, doing research, so basically, Often I hear, let's plan for some incremental research, which we can do quickly in one week. Let's see how we can optimize something which is possible to get out of paper. How can we make it as incremental as possible and still get it accepted, right? So this is something many people actually start thinking of, how can we optimize to get a good paper? And that's something you should not do. You should say, what can I do to make good research? How can I define a long-term goal, solve a hard problem, instead of just adding one incremental thing on my previous paper and trying to publish this? I think this is like one of the things which is why this is coming apart along is that there's a problem with the research evaluation, right? If you have three CVPR papers, it's better than two. Well, in essence, if you have two good CVPR papers, it's actually much better than if you have three, right? So basically, this is something I think the community has to think of and it has to be avoided. And I would encourage you not to go with this trend, along this trend of just adding one simple thing, but to make really good research and write good papers. And then in the long term, it pays off because good papers get citations, right? So if in the long term you look how your research is evaluated, you don't look at these incremental papers, which as Chichendra said, they just disappear from the planet, but they look, people look at what people cite and what is reused. And then the other thing, how to do good research, avoid overcomplicated methods and which goes along overcomplicated descriptions. So in many, many cases, people just try to overcomplicate the methods to make their papers look better, right? So instead of proposing some simple approach, which they use, know they work and maybe nobody would, would accept it, just add a few layers and a few more components to make it look better. And so basically, I would suggest not making the models complex without evaluating why it's necessary. So it's very important that if you add, make a complex model, that you evaluate the necessity to, and that you justify why the model is complex and what are different components of the approach. So that goes along with evaluating properly the individual components of the approach. So 
we have been seeing so many ECCD papers recently where people put together these complex models and it's not clear where the components come from and then in the rebuttal people have to regularize something together to show what these components bring. So instead, just from the start, have a proper relation what these individual components bring. And then something else which is really to be avoided is design models for one particular data set, right? So this is something also, I mean, people have been getting away from this, so now standard tradition is that you use not only one data set, but maybe two or three. But in many cases, I see people trying out things on several data sets, then they tr just discard the data sets for it doesn't work and they don't report. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we have all seen this and it's really not good practice, right? So if it doesn't work, you should report it in your paper or get it to work or explain why. And then another thing, another pro problem with bad research, I mean, this is like, what is bad is if you propose, if missing baselines are not there, so that's people don't do that anyway, they're, they're in general deep de baselines, but in many cases the baselines are flawed. So what do I mean by flawed baselines? The baseline is implemented without care and produces suboptimal results. So you spend like one hour implementing some bad baseline, the results are bad, you have your own approach and you show that it's much better. And that's something which you should use code which is online available, which the parameters which are online available to make really sure that your baseline is properly evaluated. And then another thing which is improper is to use weak baselines to show a bigger gap, right? So basically in many cases you have a nice complex model. If you put it on a strong baseline, you don't get the gain. So what people then do, they use a very weak baseline and then this complex model gives a better gain. So basically it's just cheating away the gain of the model. And again, this is not moving forward research, it's just like, making sure that your paper gets published without any good research and basically cheating your way around. And then next step is proper evaluation. If you have research on computer vision, it's important to do proper evaluation. <coughs> and so basically everybody knows you should not be t tuning your parameters on a test set. But what I've seen so many times that people look at the results on a test set to decide what to do next, right? So it's again, you shouldn't do that. You know? Many, many students just look what they get on the test set and they say, I'll change the approach and then I reevaluate. And then in the end, it's not, maybe not fine tuning on the test set, but almost as fine tuning on the test set. So this is something that should be really avoided. And this is something if you to take, talk to people from machine learning, they always say you should report results on multiple splits. I mean, here in our community, nobody does it because it, the, the, the timings are too slow. But basically, ideally, you would really split the test set, the, the data set into multiple parts and run it on these different combinations and report the the mean and the deviation. So again, so tuning parameters by looking at the results on the test set. <coughs> and then when something which is also off-putting is to avoid the precise description of the, how the parameters were set. So basically, without loss of generality, we can assume that the parameters don't vary much or something, right? And then you just, people write this like, as they write in the introduction, object is general, they just write something like this. And then, the last part is like changing the training and tests set up with respect to the state of the art, again, to make your results look better. So basically it doesn't work on the full training and test set, so you decide, <laughs> you decide to have a subset. And so basically you have sets like human 3.6, where there was an initial split, and then each paper proposed another split. So now when we compare to the state of the art, we have to evaluate it on f four or five different splits. I mean, this is something which is totally, I mean, totally not possible that everybody decides, designs their own split. Of course, it's sometimes necessary to correct the data set, but if you just do it to show that your results work, that's also something which you really should avoid doing. And the last, last part, you should really, for each paper, ideally you should open source the code and the data. And this should be done ideally for each paper. There's argumentations that you should do that actually before you submit the paper so that, that reviewers can reboost the, the results. I think that's not possible, but the argument, which I often hear, it's too much work to open source my, my my code should be something which people should just be discouraged from doing, right? You can spend a week or two open sourcing your code and data, and it's actually an effort which pays off in the long term, right? If the code is available and it works, obviously if it doesn't work, then you don't want to put it online, but that's like a bad argument. So if the code is online and it works, people will use your p the code and will cite your paper more and your work is more visible. So that's something you definitely should do. And it should come with a full description of the parameters, the setup, and the data, right? In many cases, just people just put some random components there. You try to reuse it, it doesn't give the same results. And you wonder why you have to email the authors 10 times to figure out what's going on. So you really should have a complete description which runs without having much effort. And so this is important to make the results reproducible. And my last point is actually, so in many cases, conference publications are rushed. I mean, this is kind of what happens basically to everybody here in the room. But then I think it's important to put up 
some complete version, be it a journal paper, be it an archive paper where the results are fully visible, evaluated, and properly described. So this is like, I'm now stepping down as an editor-in-chief for ITCV, so can make publication, can make publicity for a journal. Basically, it's important that people like either publish in journals or might make the results fully complete that you evaluate what's going on, make an in-depth in evaluation, and for journal papers, you get a constructive feedback from the reviewers, which is also helping you to improve the, the overall description of your work. And again, it can be also an archive publication where everything is properly evaluated and described and not just like this eight page or four page papers where a lot of details are missing. Okay, thank you. Time for a few questions. Well, I'll bellow into the mic even better. I, I want to, I, this is not really a question and I won't pretend it is. I want to really second Cordelia's remarks about open sourcing. If you look at the psychology community, they have a crisis of conscience, of believability, of credibility, because they all hide their data, they screw up their statistics, and you can't believe anything that they've done as a result. The reason we don't have that, even though we do hard experiments, is we can each see each other's code and data, and if somebody publishes something stupid, somebody else is gonna take the code, run it on the data, and say you screwed it up. And it's a really, really helpful and wonderful mechanism. It protects us from very scary things. The second thing I wanna say is, I love your remarks about test train splits, but it is in fact barbarous to use only one split. You should use multiple yeah, splits. Yeah, that's what I said, right? Estimate <laughs> variance. You should use multiple splits, estimate variance, and use significance predictions to look at improvements. Mm. Most of the improvements we get with methods in the literature aren't, in fact, improvements. They're results of lucky shots with variance, and we need to, we need to recognize that. And uh, just to add to that, it, sometimes it may be necessary to have a test server which, with a single split of the test set, but there are still some things that can be done with bootstrap sampling. So for the VQA challenge, I know the two student organizers every year with uploaded predictions take in bootstrap sampling and find out that often the rankings have partial orderings where you cannot tell the difference between certain methods, and, and that's how we avoid join winners of the paper. Um, if there's nobody else, this could go on for hours. There must be somebody else. So, so regarding the train test splits, um, as like a junior researcher, it seems like it's not very common to report on multiple train test splits. So if I'm a reviewer and I see a paper that follows the trend of not doing this, what do you do? Do you reject the paper? Do you ask them to uh, evaluate the multiple train test splits? And if you don't ask them, how do you change the practice? No, I think, okay. <laughs> I think it's something which, if you don't do it, I mean, the, the reviewers shouldn't, I mean, for now it's not standard, so I think they shouldn't ask for it, but it's like, it would be good practice, right? I think it's something which people should be looking into and doing, so. Uh, I have quite a standard uh, in my Yeah, but it's not a reason for rejection, right? Because it's not standard in the community, so it's not a reason. I mean, you shouldn't like go and reject papers just because it, somebody's not doing what nobody else does, right? And it's kind of something that's clearly missing in the community. <laughs> Any other questions? Another controversial question. Um, You've described the experimental paper. Are there rules for theoretical papers? Are, are people not writing those anymore? They are? For theoretical papers, do these things still apply in terms of how to do the papers? You mean the theoretical paper without any experiments, you mean, or? I mean, the methods you described may be more applicable for experimental papers. Um, yeah, sure, but I mean, in computer vision, I, I don't, I cannot really see how you write a paper without any experiments. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, if you say, this is in theory, it should work like this. I mean, you have to show some proof of, of 
validation. I think, I mean, or can you give an example of a theory I mean, paper? I there used to be back in Jesus. Yeah, the geometry papers, sure, yeah. but that, that's like maths, right? Basically, you can show that from equation A, you go to equation B to equation C, <coughs> and then you don't necessarily need an evaluation. Fine, then this doesn't apply, but I think this kind of papers, they're like basically, they are an out of fashion. <laughs> I mean. All right, let's thank Cordelia again. All right, our, our next speaker is uh, Derek Hoyle. Um, Derek is a faculty member at UIUC and also at Reconstruct. Um, uh, we're doing informal introductions, non-technical introductions. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that for me at least, has, uh, I've, that I've been struck with about Derek is the level of preparation and meticulousness that he, that he puts in often for his work and his talks and the insight that, that he often derives from that level of preparation. As a concrete example, uh, last year we had invited Derek to give a talk at the VQA workshop, and in preparation for that talk alone, he had gone back and read close to 25 or 30 papers in order to be sure that he was making a particular comment about how things are evaluated right now in state of the art and how they should be, and he went back and, and did that analysis just for that talk alone. Um, and I'm, I'm sure we all benefited from that insight, which was derived from that work. Um, um, I, for the people in my generation, Derek was always uh, aspirational. Uh, when you got into grad school, uh, Derek was who you wanted to grow up to be. Uh, and some of us still continue to believe that. Someday I'll grow up to be Derek. So Derek, we're happy to hear from you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm actually, I love this workshop. I thought it would be for the young researchers, but I've found that I've gotten so much out of it. I haven't been able to leave since I came in the morning, so it's really great, thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of really good talks on uh, specific topics, often on tactics. I want to talk a little bit about the strategy, especially as it pertains to being part of a community rather than being off on an island doing research by yourself. So one part of that is, uh, how do you choose a research direction given that you're part of a community? I think it's really important to think of yourself as part of a team when you're thinking of what your research strategy will be or what directions you're going to pursue. And part of that is to not crowd the ball. So it's really common if you see little players in soccer, they all want to run at the ball. They're very energetic, they have a lot of enthusiasm. You can see that the entire red team stays within about one foot of the ball the entire game. And it's very natural, we do the same thing in research. You see somebody doing a popular topic, you see lots of other people going for it, and your inclination is, yes, I wanna do that too. That's the, that's the place that I'm going to make an impact. Of course, it's not really the most productive uh, way to go about things, and so basically the ball ends up near the red team's goal the entire game. So for research, what this means is don't crowd the ball, try to find your position. So what's your unique perspective or angle? For me, for example, I was always extremely interested in object detection, but I knew that people like Ross Gershik and David Ramanan were, were much better at it than I am. So instead, I did things like context and building tools to analyze object detectors, which would magnify their impact, because these were things that I thought I had some you know, different idea that might be able to contribute to the area and didn't put me in direct competition with people that were better at that than I am. So you have to think about what other people are doing and then how can your research influence other people and how can you advance the community as a whole rather than just thinking about what is the value of your contribution in isolation. Now that's not to say that you should always avoid popular topics. Sometimes you'll find that the most popular topic is actually the one that you're best suited to address. And in that case, you should just take the ball and run with it. 
The next piece of thinking of your research as part of the team is to aim ahead of your target. So if you're, if you're passing a ball, you don't want to pass the ball right at the player that's running. You want to pass it ahead of them so they get there at the same time that the ball does. And it's the same in research. It can be helpful to think about um, what, where are the current directions of the field taking it. So if people solve the problems that they're currently working on, then what would they realize are the next problems to work on? And start thinking about those problems and trying to address them. So after, after my PhD, I was lucky that I had a lot of time to think. I got this, uh, I had this uh, postdoc thing where I didn't have an advisor, so I was just off being able to do whatever I wanted. And so I just thought a lot about what would happen if people solved object detection. And it seemed like you would, you would basically have a computer that produces these bounding boxes with numbers associ associated with them, but it would have no idea what these numbers mean. And so that led me to get interested in trying to uh, find, uh, trying to teach computers th about the commonality of different categories, about attributes, about generalizing across categories, and it led to a direction of res research that was interesting for me. And then the third piece of that is to celebrate the win of the vision community. You know, a lot of times the success of the vision community may not have you at the center of it. Sometimes things that you're doing will get scooped by other people. But if you're really thinking about the progress of the community as a whole and thinking of your goal as to further the aims of the community, then you can take a lot of satisfaction when the community does make big gains, whether or not you are a central part of that effort. I think that's really important for maintaining your uh, sanity and peace of mind if, when you pursue a long research career. The second set of principles is, is related to uh, writing and reviewing. And I think it's, it's basically the same principles propagate from being an author to a reviewer to an AC and even to a program chair. And I think the most important thing is to focus on the paper's potential to teach. So as an author, your goal should not be to try to impress people or you know, make them think that your results are amazing or that you're very clever. Instead, you always want to think about it from the reader's perspective, aim to teach and inspire, and that's what people will truly value. If you can write something where the, where the reader actually learns something that they can apply, or they get an idea for future research, then that's a really valuable contribution. And try to always think about, am I, am I writing this to try to teach somebody that's a good thing, or am I writing it to try to impress them, and that's maybe not such a good thing. Likewise, as a reviewer, it's important to think about what the paper can teach you. So I think it's important to avoid putting too much weight on whether you think the topic is interesting, because somebody thinks that to the topic is interesting. Obviously, the person who wrote the paper does. And if they do, probably a lot of other people do too. We tend to be biased in our novelty estimates to thinking that uh, papers that are in very popular topics or topics that we're working on are much more novel. If I've been thinking a lot about losses for deep networks and then somebody else does a little tweak on that loss and it makes a big difference, I'll be really impressed because I'll think, oh wow, you know, I didn't think of that and that made a big difference. That was a really big contribution. While if somebody that's in a completely different area, 3D reconstruction that I don't know much about, is able to, to make a very significant contribution, I might just think, oh, you know, I've, I've seen 3D reconstruction papers before, there's not really much new here. So you need to be aware of these biases, and generally, we never really know which directions will make an impact. So focus on, can the, t can the paper actually teach you something new? Does it have a new idea? Do they demonstrate it with experiments? And if so, then it's probably an acceptable paper. So this propagates further to, to uh, area chair. So if you're an area chair, I think the best time that you can invest is, is to try to identify reviewers who you think will enjoy reading the paper, who will, who will get something out of it if there is something to get out of the paper. If you can do that, then you'll have a set of people who, who will be looking for valuable contributions and whose reviews will reflect that. If you try to skimp on that part of the process and you assign it to random reviewers or even reviewers you trust but that are not interested in that area, then you're going to get uh, just a wild mix of opinions and you're going to have to do a lot of work afterwards to disentangle them and may not have the correct outcome for the paper. Likewise, you want to focus on whether the paper can really teach something new and if there's just one person that says, oh, there was a really good idea in this paper and they demonstrated it sufficiently, then you should 
give strong consideration to that paper, even if there's two other reviewers that say, oh, you know, I don't really like the topic that much, or it's not that interesting, or they could have had better results, or run in another data set. If there's one person that says, I learned something, then that's a big mark, a, a big stamp of approval for the paper, and that, sh that should be a, a incline you towards accepting it. And then uh, it's important to advocate for papers that are creative or technically strong, but are not in fashion, because these papers uh, kind of have the, de the deck stacked against them when they go through the reviewing process. So the, the final uh, principles are, are in the directions that you choose in your career. So we all have many opportunities. We could, uh, go in, we could choose to take, if you're in academia, you could choose to take a job in industry, you could do a startup, you can start a new research direction, you can decide to teach a new class, start a blog, you know, many different things you can do. So how do you decide which ones are worth doing? I think, um, I tend to think, of, when I think about this, I think about a root-bound plant, or this is, this is kind of the counterexample of what you don't want to be. So, <laughs> If, uh, if you take a plant and you put it in a little pot and you just leave it in that pot and water it and let it grow, it will grow for some time and its roots will grow and the plant will grow. But then the roots uh, absorb the nutrients, they get too big for the space, they get tangled up, the roots will die, the plant will wither. That can happen to researchers as well. If you just decide that you're gonna take what you know now and just stick with it and keep following that one path and kind of stay in that little potted plant that you built for yourself when you were a PhD student, then eventually you're going to lose your creativity, you're gonna lose your ability to adopt to the field, and, uh, and eventually your, your uh, ability to produce good research is, go is going to wither. So whenever, you have a, whenever you're deciding on what kind of direction you should pursue, it's really important to choose, choose an activity that has a high potential for learning as well as a potential for impact. Try to constantly challenge yourself and learn something new, whether it's a new technical skill or a new personal skill, uh, but that always maximizing that opportunity for learning is extremely important. So in summary, my, the uh, key principles to thrive are in choosing research directions, think of yourself as part of the team. Your goal is to maximize the contribution of the entire community rather than to make the most singly important contribution that you can make. And so you need to try to think about how you can best contribute to anticipate and address upcoming problems. And then if you do that, then you can be satisfied whenever the vision community makes progress, you can feel like you played your part. In writing and reviewing, focus on the paper's ability to teach. And in your career, make sure that you continue to grow and adapt. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Hello, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I want to ask about the point where you say uh, we shouldn't focus on maybe a narrow problem where we don't learn a lot. But in vision, in general, I find that almost any problem you're working on, you know, there's a lot of things you can learn. and on set of techniques, like new techniques, you can apply to almost every problem you're working on. So, like, what's what's uh, you can you clarify a little bit, you know, on this and how is how narrow is too narrow or how broad is too broad? Um, sure. Yes, that's a good point. And so I think it's really a matter of time scale. So while you're working on your PhD, it, it may be a good idea to focus on a narrow set of problems where you can become, you know, the prominent expert on that set of topics, but. Uh, as you think about your career over 5 or 10 or 15, 20, 25 years, um, if your chances are if you're still doing the same thing that you're doing as a PhD student 25 years later, you haven't really explored, uh, you know, broadened your horizons enough. And so it's, it's not a specific uh, recommendation to make sure that you stop doing what you were doing, you know, five years ago, but, um, but always just make sure that you're continually pushing yourself to learn new things and do not only stick with the things that are most familiar to you or where you feel like you have you know the most leadership in the field so far uh, Derek if I can uh, ask you to press on your to extend your metaphor of the crowding the ball um, 
I, I suppose one of the reasons, I imagine one of the reasons why people, especially junior people might run to the ball is if you want to play the strategy of going to where you believe the ball will be, you have to trust on two things. One is your ability to predict where it's going to be and two, the cooperative nature of the team to pass it to you when, <laughs> when you may be best suited to take it. Uh, and so in particular, when you're junior, you may have doubts about both of those. So how do you, how, what, what advice would you give to people uh, in terms of that, like predicting, how do they build a sense for where things are going to be? That's a good question, and I, and I forgot to mention, of course, one caveat to that metaphor is that in a soccer team, you know, you, everybody has a position that's all well organized. In this case, it's all self-organizing, so it's a much more difficult problem. Um, but I think really, uh, of course, it's a challenge to figure out where the community is headed, where, which problems are likely to be solved soon, who's the best person to solve them. But I think, you know, generally the more, uh, the way, I guess the way, the, the process that I would generally follow is read as much as you can, talk to people as much as you can, find people that are very creative and, and uh, talk to them. And then also uh, just air out your ideas with lots of talks, uh, even if you're talking to yourself. <laughs> um, if, you, if you try saying something out loud and it doesn't sound interesting, or, it, or it, sometimes when you say it out loud, it loses its credibility. And so you can think about, you know, if I try to make a compelling case for, you know, this is going to be the big problem that people are going to be interested in two years, if you can articulate that well, then chances are that, you know, it has some merit or at least you'll be able to uh, get other people interested in that idea. If you can't articulate it, if you talk to other people about it and nobody's buying into it, then that might be a sign that you're a little bit off base. Yeah. Uh, you sort of just answered the question I was about to say, but uh, when, especially when you're a, uh, a PhD student, when you have a lot limited time to work on maybe one or two topics, how do you know when is the right time to give up on a research direction? Because you know you, you try to find your spot, but let's say the soccer players move in the other direction. How do you know when that's happened, basically? Um, so I think the question is, how do you know if you know, like it's time to end your line of research and you know, start a new one? Um, so yeah, this has happened to me. I mean. Uh, you know, I was doing work on 3DC understanding, and at some point, I just felt like I didn't have a new good idea. And, and so then I thought, you know, if I don't have a new good idea, if there's not something that I'm excited about pursuing, um, then it's time to stop doing that for a while, and, you know, maybe I'll come back to it in a few years, which I, which I did. Um, so I think it just comes down to, do you, have, do you have that, do you still feel like you have a unique angle on the problem or not? If you do, then keep going. If not, then maybe find something else. Yeah. We'll stop here with the questions, but uh, there is a panel at the end of the day and you're welcome to ask those. Let's thank Derek. So, um, so I get to introduce Devi, which is a pleasure. Um, Devi, of course, did not assign herself a talk, but I asked her to <laughs> give a talk anyway. Devi is really a powerhouse of productivity. And you know, I always wondered, you know, uh, how she can be so productive. Um, and I think that part of it is that she's uh, very good at organization. Uh, one of the biggest, one of the most important skills that you need to learn when you go from a PhD where you have laser focus on a single problem to a professional researcher where suddenly you're balancing lots of different tasks and have many different opportunities open to you is how to manage your time. And Devi wrote this really great blog post it got like over a thousand claps on Medium, and it actually influenced how I like do my own calendars. And so I thought like this really needs to be part of this workshop, and and happily she agreed to talk about it. Thank you, Derek. All right, um, so this is a strange talk to give. I have not talked about this in the past. Um, and this is very central to how I operate, but 
up until this blog post, it wasn't sort of a topic of conversation too much, except for with our students in the lab, and that too was also, I think, just about a year ago. Um, so I'll give this a shot. Um, I have to let you know that it's a very texty slide. I couldn't think of how to make time management visual, and so um, I have like little random pictures on the bottom right corner as an attempt of having less, less text, um, but we'll see how this goes. All right, um, and so I uh, use uh, my calendar as my central way of organizing my life. I don't use lists at all. Um, and so I'm just gonna walk through uh, what I do and I find that to be useful and maybe you'll find that to be useful too. Um, so the way I think about this is that um, the goal of why I try and organize things is so that I can stay on top of things. Um, and my primary goal in life to quite an extent um, is to avoid drama and to avoid stress. Um, and so that's my primary motivation of why I like to stay on top of things. Um, the assumption here is that um, your bottleneck is time management and not motivation. Um, so if your issue is motivation, these slides will not help. Um, the assumption is that you are motivated to get stuff done, but <laughs> you don't know how to manage your time. And if that's the case, then hopefully this will be helpful. Um, and so the philosophy around um, this whole thing is that the reason I like calendars is that calendars help convert time to space because sort of there are these columns for your day, there are blocks for hours, um, and I find that to be uh, very useful. And the reason for that is we, I think, and it's probably true for many people, um, that the finiteness of space is always clear to us, but somehow the finiteness of time is not. It always seems like you can always get stuff done by tomorrow. Um, and so I think by insisting on looking at calendars, it forces you to think about the finiteness of time. Um, and so just like physical space constraints are always apparent and obvious to us, the, the constraints of time also become apparent if you plan around calendars. And so the approach <laughs> is the following. Um, every task, and it'll become clear what I mean by every, those of you who read the blog post realize to what extent I mean every, um, is an entry on the calendar. Um, the goal is to do the task at that time. Um, once you do the task, you move it to another calendar that I like to call done. You can call it whatever you want, so you know exactly what you've gotten done and what's left. Um, and the goal is at the end of the day, you go to bed with an empty to-do calendar and everything what that was on your to-do calendar is on your done calendar. The way to get this done is either because you got everything done, which is awesome, but that doesn't always happen. Um, and so the other way in which that happens is you replan. Um, and what I mean by that will become clear. But so this is the overall approach. All right, and so there's um, these seven principles that I had um, laid out and how I approach this, and I'll walk through each one, um, one at a time, which will make some aspects of this methodology uh, clear. Um, so the main thing is everything takes time, right? Everything takes time. Um, and that's why everything needs to be on your calendar, if you're planning around your calendar, right? Um, and so let me expand on that a little bit more. Um, so time is always ticking, right? Even when you're doing nothing, time is ticking. Um, and time is finite, right? So, um, which means if you have enough things to do, time will be a bottleneck, right? You can't stop time to get while, so that you can do things while it holds on, and you're not gonna have infinite time, so you just have to make everything fit. Um, and so you have to plan around time being central. I just don't understand how people um, plan around lists, and we can talk about this maybe more in the panel, but I just, I think the bottleneck is time, and so you have to plan around time, and that's why um, calendars is how I do it and not with lists, because in lists, there's no time element to it. Um, and everything needs to be on the calendar, and so what I mean by this is even personal stuff, so even things like a lunch break, or when you're going to be sleeping, or when you're going to the gym, or when you're exercising, um, stuff you do for fun, um, errands you need to run, even if you're going to just do nothing and relax, maybe read a book, all of that just needs to be on there so that you can make sure that actually happens, otherwise you might run out of time to do those fun things. All the professional stuff, I think this might be more obvious, things like meetings, I think a lot of people have on their calendar, but even non-meeting professional things, like the tasks you need to get done, even I wanna just sit down and think about research in this block of time, so I don't want any meetings, that's on the calendar. Um, replying to emails, um, things like that, um, that's all on, on the calendar. Even longer term stuff, that my passport is expiring in 2023, and so I need to apply for renewing that um, in April, say that just needs to be on the calendar because that'll take time. Um, and so that needs to be there. This is also recursive. So if you're planning longer term things, like if you need to plan a vacation and that's gonna take you six hours, 
you might not do it all in one chunk of um, six hours or even figuring out what I need to buy tickets, I need to book the hotel, I need to look into this tour. All of those are individual things. And so even planning to plan might have to be on the calendar if the thing that needs to be planned takes some time. Everything takes time, right? Planning takes time too. Um, and so that needs to be on the calendar as well. And so nothing is too trivial to be on the calendar because nothing takes zero time, right? Um, and one nice thing with the strategy is that nothing gets dropped. You're not going to forget to renew your passport in 2023 because you had already put that there when you got the passport in the first place, right? So when everything is just written down, you're not going to have to remember anything. You're not going to drop anything. So some of this is going to sound over the top. I am aware of that. I know that's been my <laughs> um, way of operating and not everyone is used to this. So just you're welcome to take it with a grain of salt. This is just what I do. Um, so that's one uh, principle. The second principle is um, incorporate your multiplier factor. Um, and so what I, sorry, I went the wrong direction. Um, and so what I mean by that is the following. So by multiplier factor, you might think something is gonna take 30 minutes, but it probably takes something that is not equal to 30 minutes. In most cases, it takes longer than 30 minutes just based on interacting with people. In some cases, it might take less. And so you should do some sort of try and keep track of this to figure out what that multiplier factor for you tends to be. If you think something takes X time, does it take 1.5X, does it take 2X, does it take 3X? But figure that out for yourself. And then, um, and keep in mind that measuring this is easier than fixing it, right? Ideally, you want this to be 1.0, but that's a much larger battle. All I'm saying is just measure it and then incorporate it in as you plan. Um, and so when you put something down, think about how long it'll take, multiply the factor after you've thought about how much it'll take, and then put that down. It will feel like an overkill for sure because your gut instinct is it'll take me 30 minutes, but data shows that it always takes you 1.5 times that amount. So 45 minutes will feel like an overkill, but that's the point of data. You don't get to ignore it, right? If you think it'll still take me 30, that's just delusional. Um, so don't do that. And that's what makes sure that the plan is feasible because you can only pack things that 24 hours can hold. You've incorporated your multiplier factor, so this has potential to work. Right? And if things don't fit, you have to prioritize. Don't just push it back down. Again, that's delusional, right? It's, you're not gonna be able to get it done if data suggests that you can't do it. So you just have to prioritize and try and figure out how to do less. Um, and one nice thing is as you start measuring this multiplier, you might find ways to actually try and shrink it down to 1.0. So that's another bonus that you get from this. The third factor is, uh, third principle is incorporate your patterns. Um, so maybe you happen to work in an environment where unexpected things happen. Um, I don't have kids, but I'm told that if you have young kids, then that often leads to sources of unexpected things happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe you're not a morning person. Um, maybe your friends make impromptu plans on Saturdays that just come up. Maybe you don't like working on Sundays. Maybe you tend to be too tired from the week on Sundays. Um, all of this needs to be factored in. And so just mark your calendar Sundays as I tend to be too tired to work on Sundays and so just block it all out. So don't plan on doing anything. Don't plan on getting up at 8 a.m. and working on something if you're not a morning person, right? Um, and so give yourself plenty of buffer and don't mix your battles, right? You're trying to stay on top of life. Maybe you would like to be a morning person. Don't mix those in. Once you figure out how to be a morning person, you can try and plan around that. But don't sort of, um, yeah. <laughs> The fourth principle, and I think this is very important, um, is to replan because your plan as you start out will be feasible, but you still, there's a good chance you won't be able to get it all done. Um, and so it's not guaranteed. And so whatever doesn't get done needs to be moved around to some other empty slot in the future. Um, where it gets moved to depends on how urgent this thing is. When, and maybe there's something else in that slot that needs to be moved further out. So there's a little bit of sort of puzzle solving that needs to happen. And again, here the finiteness of time becomes very apparent because if you just say, oh, I didn't get this done today, I'll do it tomorrow, but you already have these other things you need to do tomorrow. So what, something needs to move. And so you need to think about what needs to move and this calendar will make it very obvious because when you try and take this and put it tomorrow, there's no non-overlapping spot to place it in. And so you'll have to figure out what needs to move, right? Um, and then as soon as you replan, you're all set, right? <laughs> it's a new day um, and you have a feasible plan again and sort of life keeps ticking from there, rinse and repeat. Um, and so the way I think of this when I go to bed is I think a successful day is not necessarily where I get everything done. That's awesome if that happens, but it's one where I have a new plan for tomorrow morning that's still feasible given the finiteness of time. And so replanning, I don't think of it as a failure at all. Um, it's just part of a plan. Um, and I personally tend to get a high out of moving things from the to-do to the done calendar, and that actually keeps me motivated. I might be willing to stay up 30 minutes longer if I know I can just move this extra thing over, and so that might work for you as well. 
Um, this one is also very important. Um, you have to break things down. So for example, getting a paper at submitted to ICCV next year is not something that you can just put as one thing on the calendar. Um, you have to break it down <laughs> into calendar sized chunks um, and then place those in appropriate points in time. And that's where the multiplier, fa multiplier factor kicks in. If you break it down sufficiently, you'll have a reasonable estimate of what that multiplier factor can be. Um, and like I said before, making a plan can sometimes take time. And so that should be an entry on your calendar as well. Um, this one is, um, I think, uh, my favorite. So backtrack and foresee. Um, and so what I mean by this, a conference deadline is three months out, right? Jitendra said that your paper needs to be written up two, two weeks before that, which means if you're gonna go through all the iterations, you need to start writing two weeks before that, which means if you wanna do a whole bunch of analysis, which might take several weeks, you need to have your first concrete result three weeks before that, and so that is already, I don't know, maybe three, four weeks out from now, right? And so that all sort of backtracking tells you when stuff needs to happen, whereas three months in itself might feel like, oh, it's a while from now, and that's not an issue. But if you backtrack, you realize that things are much more urgent than they might seem. Um, and by 4C, you're sort of going in the opposite direction. If you know that when I come to CVPR, I don't get anything done, that's what my past data suggests, then just block the CVPR week off on your calendar and don't plan on doing anything. Don't try and get stuff done because you know you failed in the past, right? And so this is similar to incorporating your patterns. Um, maybe even family visits, you, don't get, you can't get anything done. Um, and so this, again, if you know that something is due in six weeks, but the week before that, I'm at CVPR, the week before that, my family is visiting, and so on, you might realize that I really have only one week to get this done, even though on the surface it looks like I have six weeks to go. Right, and so that really sort of elevates um, the urgency. And your calendar will tell you all of this because you'll have blocked the week of CVPR, you'll have blocked the week of your family visiting, and so as you plan this thing that needs to be done in the next six weeks, the only open slots will be in the next few weeks and not after that, and so the calendar will just tell you all of this. Um, things just won't fit. One important thing, though, backtracking tells you the latest by which something needs to be done. That doesn't mean that's when you plan on doing it, right? That's, like, that's the latest, you need to have buffers um, to be able to get there. All right, and the last principle um, is visualize your time. So something that I like doing every night is to just look at what tomorrow is like. Is it sort of heavy in the morning with a lot of meetings or if, am I gonna have the afternoon to think about things? And just generally having a visual sense of what tomorrow looks like, I find that to be quite useful um, when I go to bed. Um, and same, I also do that for a week. So I tend to look at my next week out um, and I find that to be useful. I don't do it at any longer time horizon. Um, and so to summarize, um, one, backtrack and foresee. So look at your calendar to see where there's space to place stuff. Every single thing um, needs to be a calendar entry. When you make it a calendar entry, make sure you're incorporating your multiplier factor after your initial estimate of how long you think something will take. Incorporate your patterns, just your personal tendencies and lifestyle. Um, break larger tasks down into smaller things so that it's actually a meaningful entry on the calendar. Um, obviously do the task um, at that time, and this might relate to motivation a little bit. Um, once you're done, move it to the done calendar, um, visualize your tomorrow, visualize your next week, um, and then the goal is to go to bed with an empty to-do calendar, either because you got everything done or because you replanned and moved things around. Um, and so here's an example of, um, it's a made-up calendar, it's fairly close to what reality looks like often. Um, I also had a couple of things on emails, but I think I'm running out of time, so I'll just stop here and leave this up um, to take any questions. Any questions? So uh, about the conference planning, for example, right? Um, you expect an experiment to work, it doesn't work. You expect the next one to work, it doesn't work. Um, how do you deal with that with respect to putting things in time spot slots? With multiplier factors. So you already know that the first experiment, you just told me that. The first experiment you do is not gonna work. The second experiment you do is not gonna work. So if you know that you need your first experiment to be done by week three, and you know every experiment iteration typically takes about a week, you know you, on average, tend to need four iterations before something works, you backtrack and plan from there. So th this is not me trying to say that the world doesn't have uncertainty, right? It does. My point is that some of that uncertainty is predictable. So what exactly is going to be the reason the experiment doesn't work, you don't know. 
but there is a pattern of how long it usually takes, how many iterations it usually takes to get something to work, and that should all be incorporated. And if you don't, then you're just being delusional that the first time, that in the past, that has never happened, but this time, when I run my experiment for the first time, is gonna give me the numbers I need, and that's most likely not going to happen. You might get lucky, in which case you'll have more time for analysis and more time, more sleep before the deadline, which is great, but that's all a bonus. You can't be relying on that. I could not do this the way you are doing it myself because I would lose the pieces of paper or the calendar or would drop something or whatever. But internally, you know, this kind of accounting that you're doing, I do and I find it valuable. I think there are two principles because you're a nice person and I'm not that you haven't exposed and which are important. I think modern American academia is extremely rich in silly people who want to waste your time. And a way to defend against that phenomenon is to conceal your calendar and lie about it. Both of which I do actively. I never let anybody have any access to any kind of scheduling or calendar thing for me. And I say I'll remember, and very often I deliberately forget because it's not worth doing anyhow, and then I say, oh my God, I'm confused, I'm sorry, I'm getting old or whatever. <laughs> It really does matter not to do things that are not worth doing. Yes. And those principles of concealing your calendar and lying about it are very helpful ways of doing it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually not as nice as you think I am. Um, I do that too, especially at... So I didn't have to do it so far when I was only in academia because I don't think in academia people can just plop meetings on your calendar without asking you. But since I've been working at Facebook, people can just do that. They can look at my calendar and just put a meeting on there without asking me if I want to do it. And so I have explicit blocks on my calendar to make sure I have time left to do the things that I need to do, especially because the personal things don't show up on my professional calendars. If I plan on sitting down and thinking about something at some time, others don't know that I've already committed my time to that, um, and so they'll, they'll put that down. Um, yeah. But it is important to say no to things that are not um, that are not important. And again, the calendar reveals that because if you're trying to put something down, you realize that you have to bump this other thing over. And if the thing that you're bumping over is way more important than the thing that you're trying to put down, that's a good enough reason to potentially just choose to not do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just have a quick question as well. Like how tightly do you actually follow this um, calendar? Because oftentimes maybe you bump into someone during lunch or dinner or like these things just happen. And I feel it would get frustrating if you just like every night replan and replan and don't actually get things done. Right, right. So I think um, I think there's two things there. So one comes back to the multiplier factor that if it is frequent enough that you happen to run into people over lunch and so lunch takes longer than you think, then I will just expand my lunch hour to be longer than what I think I actually need for that. And so the multiplier factor is not just for your own thing. It's also just how the world around you tends to operate. So if they are introducing uncertainties that leads to you taking longer to do something, that can go in the multiplier factor. Um, I do end up replanning almost every night. At almost every night, there's something on my calendar that I couldn't get to for whatever reason. And so I do end up doing that. I don't find that frustrating. Um, it's, it's just part of the system of how you do this. Um, and being able to, like I said, as long as when I wake up, I know that my plan for the day is feasible. Um, that's sufficient. Things also sometimes change in priority. That maybe I was planning on doing something tomorrow, but some colleague says something that makes me realize that no, I should actually get that done today. Then even in the middle of the day, I might have to swap things over um, and readjust. So it's very much an evolving um, calendar. It's not something that you just set in stone and then follow. It just gives you a very, very strong guideline um, to what, the, what needs to happen. Um, meetings, you can't move around. So I should have said the green stuff is sort of personal, um, just like routine stuff, blue is calendar. And the third color is just my to-dos and my tasks. And so I have more flexibility in when exactly I do that. For meetings, I have less flexibility. And so that also guides how I can move things around. So yeah. uh, what happens when you get like uh, IM pings or like emails and stuff? So that basically always sort of throws me off because like, whenever that happens, then you may want to respond to them at that particular time. And that will sort of move a lot of things around. Right, um, so this is a little controversial. So I do respond to them in more or less real time, including emails. I know a lot of experts advise that you shouldn't do that, you should batch it all together and so on. I do just handle it live, but that's why almost everything just has an inherent multiplier in there um, that accounts for the fact that there are going to be emails and random pings that I'm gonna to attend to, so I'm not gonna be working on that thing 100%. And so that just gets back to the multiplier factor again. Everything is slightly expanded out. So almost nothing on my calendar tends to be less than half an hour, for example, um, which is, yeah.
Right, we're running a bit behind on the schedule and we want to make sure other speakers don't get bumped off their other speaking spots. So we'll, we'll move on, we'll thank the speaker and move on, but you can ask more questions at the panel at the end of the day. So thank you. Our next speaker um, is Georgia, and I will not be able to pronounce her last name, <laughs> and she will happily accept that. Uh, she's a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Um, as I was preparing her intro yesterday, a thought struck me, which there is a well-established, uh, there is a well-established phenomena and a bias in teaching evaluations, at least, that when people talk about male instructors, they often use terms uh, to describe their smartness and their creativity, and they, when they often talk about female instructors, they talk about warmth and welcomeness. Uh, and I was struck by that because I saw myself wanting to make a comment that it would feel like it would be out of line with what uh, I described other speakers with. So let me begin by saying, Georgia is a leading young researcher in her area of action recognition, activity recognition, human pose estimation, um, and she won the uh, MAR Best Paper Award uh, last year for Mass Car CNN. In addition to tremendous respect for her, for her work, one thing in particular that uh, stood out for me is George is a wonderful collaborator to have. Uh, I know some of our students who have spent time at Facebook have actively commented on how Georgia goes out of her way for to look out for junior young researchers and, and students and make them feel welcome in new environments and just sort of look out for the well-being. In, in some sense, Georgia is an official, unofficial co-advisor to a lot of our students in, in that capacity. So we're looking forward to uh, the talk on being open. Okay, oh my God, thank you so much. This was one of the sweetest introductions I've ever had. Okay, so hi, I'm Georgia. Um, most of you maybe don't know me and that's very fair. Um, I'm very young in age and also as a researcher. Um, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes introducing myself. So it all started in 2010 when I took a plane from Greece and went all the way to um, UC Berkeley. And basically, other than um, the weather being kind of the same, um, everything else changed. Um, and so six years later than that, I got my PhD with Chitendra. Um, and then I spent another two years being a postdoc at FAIR, where I'm now a research scientist, but I actually identify as a grad student plus plus. And I wanna say some of the biggest highlights that I've tried to summarize um, in these eight years of doing research. I'd like to share them with you because maybe you'll have the same and it will be great to actually discuss that later as well. So first of all, I have written non-deep learning papers. And I realized last week that most of you here were in high school with, when AlexNet came out. Uh, I don't know if that's true, is that true? Okay, I don't see many. It, it's, it's disturbing. Um, but yes, research was happening back then as well. But I've also had many of my papers rejected. And that was actually not a bad thing, that was a very educating process. Many of my research ideas did not work. Um, and actually these were the projects where I learned the most um, because a successful project is a successful project. When something fails, there is a reason to fail, and actually understanding why is what is really important. I've also had the chance to collaborate with many, many people that has actually, what I believe has been one of the strongest impacts of me as a person and as a researcher. I've had the chance and the luck to serve on many program committees, being a reviewer. Um, and I've also served as an area chair where you kind of get to see the process behind the scenes and learn a lot from what is important and what not. Uh, but more importantly, I really try not to think about research one day a week. Um, this is not because I'm lazy. This is not because I'm not passionate. This is because I believe in diversity of the mind. I believe in the stimuli that come from interacting with other things like your community or um, your friends or nature. So I really value a healthy work-life balance. I have not accomplished it 
but I'm really working hard to make it happen. Okay. Um, so in the last, in these eight years that I've been doing research, I've gotten to realize um, some principles that uh, our community is based on. So the first one that I think is one of the most important ones is quality. Um, so it's important to realize as a grad student or as a, or as a researcher that your work reflects yourself and subsequently your community. So a bad paper is, will, will be a bad paper or your bad paper, but it'll also be, it will also impact your community as well. And of course, a good paper will be another adding block to the community. Honesty. Um, we operate on the assumption that all of us are honest. This is a little crazy. This is a little utopian. Um, it's like assuming that no citizen is gonna commit tax fraud. That's crazy. But it's our responsibility to preserve this wonderful thing that we have. And finally, openness. So we share papers, we share code, we share models, we share data sets. And most importantly, we work together. And today I'm gonna focus on these two things. Um, I'm gonna talk about the merits of open sourcing and also the merits of collaborations. And um, before I start, I wanna thank many of you because in this conference, I cornered you to talk to you about those things. Um, and they're being reflected in this talk. So just to, I know that a lot of other speakers like Cordelia and David also mentioned it, um, talked about open sourcing and its importance, but I really wanna emphasize, especially for the younger people, how actually important it is. And here are some examples of open source projects that I'm sure all of you have used. So there are data sets. I'm sure all of you have used ImageNet or Coco or Pascal VOC or so many other open source data sets. You've also used, I'm sure you have, Cafe or PyTorch or TensorFlow. And of course, you have used uh, existing models such as AlexNet, Mask or CNN or ResNet. And to emphasize a little bit how actually that is extremely important, I try to put it down in numbers. So let's assume there was no open sourcing. And you, like, you are a first year grad student and now you have to re-implement um, a ResNet model for image classification. So let's try to figure out how long it will take. So first of all, you have to collect your own data set. So I asked um, the people that were behind ImageNet, uh, Gia and Olga, how long it would take to collect ImageNet from scratch if you're a first year grad student. But it's clueless, more or less. Um, they said six months if you have infinite budget. I also asked a third year grad student how long they think it would take them to collect the ImageNet. They said it would, it would take infinite time because they would quit. So I compromised with one year. So I think it would take one year to collect, annotate, and curate ImageNet um, to the site that it's currently at. Okay, then you have to re-implement and retrain. So you have to start from building or re-implementing your favorite library. Let's say it's Cafe. I also asked Yang Chen how long it took him to write Cafe, he said three months. I asked the same grad student how long it would take him to write cafe. He said he would quit again. <laughs> so I again compromised for a year. And then you have to retrain ResNet. Um, you have to rebuild it, re retrain, debug, all that stuff. But presumably you have gained a lot of experience in these two years doing all this work. So half a year. So this is two and a half years to implement a baseline. This is half a PhD career. So now you have two and a half more years to do research. And given that your ideas will probably not work and your papers will get rejected, this is not very good. So, but would that actually be even progress? So that would lead to us having, not being able to do any benchmarking because every team would, have, would deviate from what is actually standard. 
Baseline implementation will also not be very standard. They will be noisy and they will be inaccurate. And of course, not all groups have the resources to do this. So only a few of them would be able to actually push the, the, the frontier of this, um, of this direction. So this is a little chaos. And definitely we wouldn't be here right now and we wouldn't be seeing all the success that we are um, witnessing. So, okay, is it clear that open sourcing is very important? I think so. So then I try to think how we can actually incentivize open sourcing. And of course, a lot of us see the merits of it because we understand how important it is. But I think there is a value in actually concretely providing incentives for young people to spend time open sourcing. And I'm saying that because as a grad student, you always want to move on to the next project and you not always want to take the time to clean up and provide useful code. So I was thinking, I, I wrote some ideas down. Um, I think that I don't know if they are correct or not, and I'm sure some of you will actually may disagree or not. So one of it is that all CVPR publications should be accompanied by code and models. The other one is to have, exactly like we provide an award for a best paper at every conference, could we provide an award like a best open source project for, for a paper at that conference? Then how can we actually incentivize people gaining attention by citing the work? Or there is the GitHub stars. They're not actively used in any um, evaluation, let's say, but could we somehow bring that into the research? And, uh, and finally, could we reward professors, group leads, or companies um, when they open source their code? In longer term, would it be reasonable to actually evaluate people's careers, no matter how important, um, based on open source projects? And so, these are just some ideas. I'm not even sure I agree with all of them, um, but maybe we can discuss them also later in the panel. So I'm gonna move on now to the part B, which is the merits of collaborations. And I will talk more from the perspective of a young person and of a young researcher. And I will say that for me, collaborations have been the equivalent of traveling. So you know how when you visit a new place and for example, very randomly selected Greece, um, and you see this historical monument that has so much value, and you are fascinated, and you are uh, in awe, and you get inspired by it. So this is exactly what I think collaborations are. It's a, it's a way for you to open your research horizons. You get to experience different working styles, you get to learn, adjust, and also argue. You get to learn to work with different personalities. And you usually get exposed to different set of problems because your collaborators are usually their own people. They're, they're, they're a different identity than you. And so this actually translates to growth. Um, and I will not take any other opinion other than that. I cannot see any way of collaboration, that, a healthy collaboration that could not lead to growth. And of course, I also believe that, that collaborations are bi-directional. There's junior researchers, there's senior researchers, and both of them have something to gain from collaborating. For example, for junior researchers, they, learn, they get to learn to work in a different environment. They also get to experience different working styles than what they used to do in their PhD. It's a chance to work on different topics, and they mature. And for senior researchers, I think it's a great opportunity for them because they get to train the next generation of scientists. I hope um, maybe some of the more senior researchers can also uh, say more at the panel. So again, I, I started thinking, how can we incentivize collaborations? Um, and here is again another of like bullet points of ideas. So maybe we can have some sort of, um, uh, again, judge career evaluations based on collaborations. Reward projects that are outside of that person's comfort zone. So make them do more high risk projects. And also incentivize cross university or university industry uh, 
collaborations. So this is another, again, another topic that I'd like to maybe discuss in the panel and also with all of you. And I'd like to conclude that a good citizen of CVPR is the one that pushes the field forward. Um, this translates uh, having high quality work, bringing researchers together and also sharing with the community. And I would really like to urge junior scientists to be open to collaborating with their peers and hopefully also senior scientists wanting to mentor more juniors. And thank you very much. Hi, thank you for this great talk. Um, I would like to call myself a young researcher in industry, regardless of my white beard and white hair. Um, so I would like to hear from you a bit more insights about uh, maybe how industry researchers might make it uh, appealing for the academia to collaborate and you know, vice versa based on your experience. Um, I also, I, th I believe that um, research lab and industry do really want to maintain the, the collaborations with academia because it's really, it, we, everybody really values pushing the field forward. As long as our goals are set to be the same, we want to, we want our field to grow. There is this, so if a lab is established on this premise, then I think that collaborations with academia will come in as a very natural way. Doing good work. Is that not enough? Okay, you don't seem very convinced. Hi, um, just have a quick comment also, like I want to hear your opinion on it now that you're working in the industry. Um, that it became now sort of a very much uh, competition between grad students and uh, the big companies when it comes to solving uh, large scale problems, right? Uh, so I would imagine it would be a very difficult task for a, a grad student to tackle a problem for recognition, mm -hmm. particularly when he knows Facebook and Google have a large number of GPUs and large data sets. Uh, so I would like to hear your opinion uh, on that matter and the frustration that uh, PhD students would get under such tasks. Right. Um, I mean, I, that's definitely true. Um, however, Derek said before, we don't really need to crowd the ball. Um, sure, there is some tasks out there that require more machines and because they're larger scale, but there's a lot of scientific problems. Um, so first one is, um, while that is definitely the case, that doesn't limit neither the scope of academia nor the scope of a research industry. And also, I feel that if this is something that, and actually I feel that today with the collaboration of university and academia, it's much easier for academia to actually even start in doing this thing, these things by actually acquiring more and more machines, for example, through uh, connections with industry. Hey, um, thanks for your great talk. So um, I totally agree with you about open sourcing and cleaning out code and writing blog posts and nice websites and visualizations and trying to have people understand your research and things like this. And, but I, I really do feel like we don't have enough incentives to do that. I think the incentive, like you said, is to finish your paper and then publish the next paper, um, the next um, deadline. And I wonder, um, I know you had some ideas, but I wonder uh, if you think that um, there is an issue where our community is like moving towards just hitting like all the different conference deadlines and um, not staying with one kind of topic for a while. I don't know what um, you think about this. I, I think the pressure for um, publishing is definitely something that a lot of young, young researchers are faced with. And I, um, but I really believe that here, there is where a mentor can set the pace and say, look, part of your successful project is also to open source. So this could be an incentive for the students to actually listen to their mentor. Uh, and then regarding the, the fast pace of how, re how the community is moving and the different problems, again, again, I think this is where the mentoring will come in and we'll try to again set the pace for a healthy, like, you know, a healthy growth. 
Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question is, how do you motivate uh, industry specifically to basically give away their competitive edge? Um, so if they collect a very large data set, like uh, the recent like one billion images off of Instagram, and they don't want to just share that because they're the only ones that can get that data, basically. Sure. Or um, even just like not publishing in the first place, um, like uh, certain companies tend not to do. They're still doing research, they're just not publishing it. Right. How do you um, basically motivate these companies to work against their financial interests to better the field? I mean, um, so my stand there is uh, kind of that when I do my research, I will do it on, on publicly available data set. You might have scientific um, evidence that maybe adding more data will help your models, but um, for, uh, for us researchers, is not how to get things up to 100, I mean, part of it is how to get it to 100%, but this is all not that it is. Um, what we want is we want to research new ideas that even with the data that we have publicly available, we can see progress. Um, so I don't find, it's very hard to change financial like industry to actually release data that they don't have proprietary, that, that they, they cannot release. Um, but does that really cripple us? Is that really something that will push us back? I really doubt it. Yes, okay. oh boy. I, I'll, maybe I'll jump in and comment on that because I've, I'm in both worlds right now. I think that industry, if it chooses to hide everything, will probably suffer. I mean, I think many of the big companies right, right now have, in their self-interest, realized that it is worthwhile to be open. Because when you are open, what you do, others will build on, and then you'll be able to build up on that. It, in a certain sense, if you contribute to the general pool, and the whole pool grows, that rising tide raises all boats. So if every company sort of operates selfishly, keeps their data, keeps their algorithms completely inside, the, they will themselves suffer as a result. And they will, they're much more likely to get into a setup where they think that their approach is great, but actually it is not. It's, they, their, their approach would have been beaten by some standard technique but they didn't uh, even try it because they managed to convince themselves that that was the, the right way to go. So it's, companies have to think through this one by one for themselves, and I would argue that it is in, for almost, in almost all settings, it is in their interest to be more open. There might be certain specific data sets that they will not release, but most work should really be open in their own self-interest. Yeah, David? outside that community, and as a result, basically they either stayed in place or moved backwards slowly. It's a very good example of the failure that you... So, so my advice to you in your own companies, personally, your management tends to be their interest to be open. He's a student. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's uh, thank Georgia again. <laughs> All right, our next speaker uh, is Michael Brown who is a faculty member at York University um, in, in Canada. Um, in, in a particular sense, when I was trying to think of Michael's intro yesterday, uh, I almost wanted to say Michael is the uh, good citizen of CBPR we should be aiming for. Uh, I, had the, I had the good pleasure of uh, serving as the program co-program chair with Michael for the Indian Conference on, on Computer Vision, Graphics, and Image Processing in 2016. Um, and I can confidently say that the reason why we didn't crash and burn and the reason why the conference happened that year uh, is because Michael had like very swiftly anticipated the problems that we were going to run into and politely steered us away from it without <laughs> pointing it out that we were making a fool of ourselves. <laughs> uh, and, and that's because Michael has, has graciously volunteered his time over the years to make sure that these conferences are run. Um, he's the general chair for CVPR 2018, but in, in a lot of sense, when we went to the area chair uh, meeting, he was 
the honorary program chair helping out running things even, uh, even there. Uh, and even this particular panel, after we sent out these emails, uh, Michael made sure that this event was uh, able to happen here. So we're looking forward to giving. All right. Thank you. That's a very kind introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm Michael Brown. I'm at York University. And I joined York two years ago. And before joining York, I worked in Asia for 14 years. So I was in Singapore for 11 years and Hong Kong for three years. So that's why my title has uh, Chinese in it. So I see many Chinese colleagues here. So what does this say? Da jia. Right? So da jia means welcome everyone. And I really wanted to use this title because I want to highlight the W and the E because I want to highlight the West and East computer vision conferences. Um, so really the, my talk's about the try a better integration between the West and East uh, computer vision communities, which I've been a part of both. So I am the general chair this year, so I have some numbers that you don't have yet, so let me share them with you. So this is the top five countries that have, a sent, that have sent attendees to CVPR. So this is an American conference, so not surprisingly, the first one is United States. So let's look at the next four, which, because that's a little bit more interesting. So if we zoom into the next four, what do you think the first one is? Or number two is China. Who's number three? South Korea. Who's number four? Japan. And who's number five? Germany. So in the top five, three are from Asia. Let's look at some more numbers. Now this one's a little bit easier to see. These are our diamond sponsors. So this year we had $2 million in sponsorship. These are our top sponsors. And as you can see, we have three out of eight. And I would argue that Microsoft, because they have a big branch, Microsoft Research Asia, I would say 3.5 out of eight. Now let's look at the next level of sponsorship. This is our platinum sponsors. Now some of these you can recognize because they have characters. Some of them you know, like Samsung. Okay, but there's many you probably don't realize are Chinese. In this case, they're all Chinese. Uh, one's Korean there. So over half are from Asia. Now, to be honest, for me, I'm not surprised because I worked in Asia. So if you look at the great research hubs in Asia, and, and by the way, I'm talking of East Asia, so I'm not including India in this, but it's not surprising. We have South Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And Across all these nations, uh, these labs in these nations, across all indicators, papers, citations, awards, are on par with the best labs in the world. Now let's look at some more numbers. These numbers aren't as fun. Organizers from Asia, Asian countries at CBPR 18. Out of 26 organizers, we had two from Asian institutions. Let's look at area chairs. Area chairs, out of 108, we had seven from Asian institutions, okay? Now, I know this, and some of my Asian colleagues know this, and they sent me emails, and they weren't very happy. So there's a real imbalance, and my Asian colleagues know this, and I think sometimes my Western colleagues aren't so aware of it, but there's an imbalance in our community. We're very Western-centric, and it's not too surprising because the Western labs have been around longer, and the Asian labs, labs are uh, are rising very quickly. Now we have other imbalances as well, and I don't want to belittle those other imbalances, but in this one I want to focus on this one that we often don't talk about. And I think one of the things I see that a lot of my Western colleagues, the mistake that they make is this Asian ethnicity does not equal representing an Asian institution. So if you invite somebody who happens to be born in South Korea and now they work for Adobe in California, when you invite them, they represent Adobe in California. They do not represent South Korea. When I worked in Singapore for 11 years, I represented Singapore. So I think this is a mistake that we make. So why am I telling you? And actually, in, in Asian culture, it's not very good to point at people. But it's kind of hard to balance everything. But why, why am I telling you? Because the fact that you're coming to this panel, by the fact that you're listening to what I have to say, you're the young generation that's coming through. You're gonna be in a position one day to organize a workshop, to do a special issue. You need to think about this. You need to be aware of it, okay? So to my Western colleagues, very simple message. Be aware of the imbalance, right? Just be aware of it. So when you start, you're organizing something, just think, oh, right, there's an imbalance. B, 
be systematic about it. So when you giving your organizing committee, have a little box on the side and count the countries. Look at the demographics. And don't be confused about the Asian ethnicity versus people coming from Asian institutions. Now, one of the problems I often see is people in Western uh, institutions, they often don't know where to look, right? You don't have any Asian colleagues or you don't know where to look. I highly encourage you to look at the area chairs for ACCV. ACCV, every time it's run, it does a very nice job of picking half of the area chairs from Asian institutions and half from Western institutions. So it's a great place to start. Another thing you can do is ask your Asian colleagues. So if you do work at an institution, you know, ask one of your colleagues from China, South Korea, Taiwan. They will know who's working, who's active in their home countries. And the another one is just mix better. You know, consider inviting speakers from Asia to your events. Just get to know them. I mean, we have to be proactive. Now, to my Eastern colleagues, so I worked there for 14 years, so I know what the environment's like, I know what the pressures are like. Don't do things only for your CV, okay? Don't th do things only to put bullets on your CV. I can't stress this enough. So I'm gonna tell a story, it's probably gonna get me banned from Singapore. Uh, I don't have to worry about the video being shown there because they'll just ban the video, so that's okay. When I worked in Singapore, we had a dean who just stepped down, and he sent an email to all faculty to explain to us how to have a good career. And he said, don't do anything that doesn't advance your career. This is big bold to all faculty. And in particular, he said, never be general chair. He said, only be program chair, because if you're program chair, it benefits your career. And in his particular area, usually the program chairs, they had their names in the proceedings, and it was considered a book. That's terrible advice. It's terrible advice. I know the pressure you have in Asia. The pressure is publish lots of papers, get lots of citations, but you have to be part of the community. If you submit five papers to PAMI, you better be reviewing for PAMI. If somebody invites you and you say, hey, I'm too busy, that's bad advice. So with that, my next advice to you is accept invitations, right? We need you to help yourself integrate into the community and recommend your colleagues. So if we send a note, we invite you, say, hey, I have some other people that you may want to consider. You have to help educate us. And don't be selfish. Don't only tell us about colleagues at your institution. Mention other institutions. Volunteer. This is the best way. Send an email. Reach out and say, hey, I'm willing to help. So my talk's very short to catch up on time. I knew we would be late. I, an I anticipated the problems. So <laughs> simple, simple motto, very simple motto. Welcome everyone, West, East. We have to do this together. But it's a little more fun if we do it in Chinese. So if you say welcome, da jia, actually if you break down these characters, it means big and one translation can be family. So welcome big family. Remember, CBPR and really all the vision conferences are 100% volunteer. We've heard this over and over and over. This happens because we all work together. The community exists because we choose to work together to make it exist. And I will tell you, because I'll be one of the general chairs for CVPR 21, David Forsyth will be one of the program chairs for uh, CVPR 21, we will do better. We were a little bit ashamed of the numbers this year. All right, thank you, big family. Thank you, Michael. Questions? We have time for some questions. Well, actually, we don't, but we'll take some. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, um, I, I have a question that, to a certain extent, also expands on what Michael said about the culture and the community. And I think there actually is an elephant in the room that we are not mentioning. And th that is that, the problem is our research, right? The people who are funding our research, by and large, are not getting profit from our research. And this is a problem. Because to, the, when, when we do good research, the, the profits go into the companies. And it doesn't go to the government. So eventually, the taxpayer is going to ask, hey, why are we supposed to fund all these guys? If Facebook makes a billion dollars, does it benefit me? And it hurts in two ways, I'll say. The first is it hurts 
um, partly the corporations want immediate things, so perhaps we tend to focus more on the immediate algos, right? Can we tune the network to quickly get a result, right? Tomorrow, I want to make money. So to a certain extent, it biases our research. The other thing that it does is that to, to the university administrators, because we are not really making money for the countries, we are not really making money for the governments and all that. So the university administrators, they don't care. So they give us body counts, right? How many papers do you get this year? How, how many? How many names do you get on top? And then if we carry on this way, our whole community goes crazy. So to go back to Michael's point, um, to a certain extent, it's great. It's wonderful that we have this community that is built on trust, that's built on many, many good values. But at a certain level, in the end, we are in a capitalistic system. We need to make, make the money come back into our community. And I would suggest that CVPR as a system, we start patenting our things. So whoever uses our, our stuff, right, the IP goes to the conference, and, it, and our research leaders become true research leaders. Like, they control the money. So I, 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 I can't do that, but it's a suggestion along that line. Oh, I have no response. That was, a, that was not a question, but, um, but, but I mean, that's, um, I, I think, I know Daniel, who, who just spoke. I think it's given you some insight into the pressures from Asia, by the way, because Daniel speaking coming from Asia, it's, it's very true. When I became a professor, I did not realize that my job was to make money. I thought my job was to educate and to do science. And a lot of institutions have changed where now it seems my job is to make money for somebody. So it's a different issue. There's different pressures. Uh, I think this is a different discussion to have than this one. OK, maybe one more so, question. So, yeah. So Michael, since you're a program chair for WACV, how's the east-west representation going there? Uh, we, we tried harder. We tried harder. Yes. But okay. the attendee list is a little different for WACV, though. The demographics are slightly different, slightly different. It's true. OK, we'll uh, reserve the rest of the questions for the panel at the end of the day. Thank you. OK, Michael. thanks. <laughs>
in, in a coherent story and a thought that is being put into these slides, wouldn't it be nice if everybody could listen to it? And so here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. And thank you. So I'm going to, uh, in fact, do two things. I'll have some quick reflections on our state as a discipline. As you can see, I take George's remarks about days off very seriously. And we're going to be sort of poking around in rather murky environments, hoping to see what we can see. And then I'll talk about what we tell the ACs. So what's our state? I have in annoyed several of my colleagues in a variety of other areas, some of them almost to the point of expiring from rage, by finding a ranking of computer science conferences, by influence and importance. The most important is CVPR. The importance number is 158. We are, we are it, right? This is the dominant gorilla in computer science. Second most important is NIPS. It's one and a half, we are one and a half times as important as NIPS. The third most important, uh, yeah, the third most important is ECCV, which is almost as important as NIPS. The third, the fourth is ICML, and the fifth, fifth is the ICCV. You may suspect some inaccuracy because I'm not absolutely convinced there was an ICCV in Istanbul in 2018, but whatever. <laughs> right? I'm being facetious here, but this is a big deal. We really are the big gorilla of computer science, and it angers sort of the riffraff in computer architecture and programming languages and systems a very great deal. But we have massive challenges from, state, uh, from scaling. So CVPR 18 was, is twice as big as CVPR 15. CVPR 15 was twice as big as CVPR 11. CVPR 63 will be the entire population of the United States. <laughs> right. I look forward to it because the intervals between my being program chair are getting shorter and shorter. So I will be program chair in 2063 when I will be 100 years old. Uh, there are consequences to these kinds of scaling. Some of the consequences are demographic, right? Most people in our community have not done X before for any X. 1,500 people at this meeting have never been to CVPR before, which is about the size of CVPR 11. At least 1,500 people, probably many more than 1,500 people. Balance is hard. You heard from Mike, CVPR 18 made errors. We tried not to make errors, believe me, but not making errors is harder than it sounds. But we'll get it right in 21. The second really serious problem we have is money and weirdness. There is a lot of money in our community. It's flowing in all sorts of directions. Mostly it's fun and benevolent. You get to go to parties. You have a third drink when you should have only had a second one, whatever. But remember, the naughtiest person in a big community is really naughty, and we're going to have problems with this. The third and most important issue that scaling presents is a loss of coherence, right? Most of what happens is fiddles on diddles on twiddles, and that's probably the way it's going to be. But if you were an intellectually ambitious, uh, excited, talented person, and you came to this conference for, fir for the first time, you would have a great deal of difficulty answering the question, what are our key aspirational problems? What should I knock off to become famous? And that is a threat to the health of our community. Okay, so I suggested three strategies. This is a, a bit of a rerun of a talk at IJCV the other evening. Firstly, we actually need regulation. Bureaucracy is a nuisance. Anybody who's been in an American university knows that there are all sorts of problems with bureaucracy, but we need it. We need principles, procedures, codes of conduct, all sorts of stuff. Uh, those of you who were area chairs will remember very long and detailed email from me saying, by this day you will do this. Here is how you will do it. This is what you're supposed to do when you do it. By this day you will do that. Here is how you will do it. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you, you will achieve it. We need that stuff. It's tedious, but we need it. The second more important strategy is training. There are an immense number of people in this community who really want to help, but do not know how. There was a blog post recently from somebody who'd received a NIPS paper to review and said, look, you know, I'm in my final year as an undergraduate. I know nothing about reviewing. What the hell do I do now? Right? The, a lot of people are in that position because a lot of papers need reviewing. We need relatively straightforward training materials to support everybody. 
the most important is referees, right? Our training mechanisms for ACs and PCs or GCs are sort of okay, but for referees, we want something like uh, what you experience in American University when they train you in sexual harassment, or I guess in not doing sexual harassment. You get a whole bunch of slides. You do slide one, and it tells you this. You do slide two, and it tells you this. And at the end of it, you sign off, right? And then you know the basic things you need to know to be a referee. You can see that those materials are being developed. Derek talked about them a little earlier, but we want to be systematic. We desperately need exposition. The big picture expositions of computer vision are old. There's an awful lot of stuff that makes an awful lot of people excited that are not there. And I propose that the senior members of our community should take on a project of what everyone should know, and industry can help. By the way, this is not me flogging my next book. I'm damned if I'm doing this on my own, right? It would kill one or two or probably three authors. It's a big deal. But industry can help. Two steps, stop hiring senior vision academics. Our job is to make PhD students, not money. Uh, right now. I keep saying it and nobody listens. The second is, it will take money to have the time to make this what everyone should know. It may not be a book. It may be a series of workshops, propagating ideas, something. But we need a sense of who we are. Okay, so back into sunlight and clear and open water. I will tell you about what we told ACs, minus a whole bunch of housekeeping about where lunches are and all that jazz. So we started with a discussion of our principles. What actually are we trying to achieve as a matter of principle? We want to make the best decisions we can to serve the community. We want these decisions to be transparent to authors. I've been doing this for years. I've never actually met a happy author. I believe they exist, but whatever. While an author may not be happy with a decision, the author should understand why the decision was made. We want the area chairs to understand what other area chairs are doing so there is reasonable consistency. People can't march in step doing these jobs, but they should understand how other people are thinking. We want the points of policy to be understood by all area chairs, and we want to minimize appeal. So then you can follow from principle to practice. What are we going to do to make this stuff happen? All decisions are based on reviews, CMT discussions, and AC discussions. Notice I said based on. I did not say reflect. Area chairs are not supposed to like say, oh, uh, 3.5, 1.5, 2.7, average, if we get this number, it's in. Right? But they are based on. You've got to use them. All decisions will have a consensus of two ACs. All decisions will have a summary setting out the basis for the decision. All summaries will have been checked by another AC using the, a checklist. We will raise and discuss points of policy at the meeting, and there is no need to tell authors how to write their papers or how to improve them. By the way, your mileage may vary, but we need statements of practice. This is what we are going to do. Uh, here are some other practices. I'll let you read them to yourself. They're not overwhelmingly important, but they give us a, a notion of the kind of thinking that was going on. Uh, we generally, if referees agree, accept, you know, you, it's likely that the thing is going to get accepted. If they agree, ex reject, it's likely the thing is going to be rejected. Um, there are policy issues. What do you do if there is plagiarism? Answer, we hand it over to the I I IEEE and they'll deal with it. Policy issues. What do we do if there is self-plagiarism? Well, it turns out it's against the rules, but nobody knew that. Nobody in our community knows that they can't pinch from their own papers. And it's extremely hard to find the rules in the IEEE operating manual that say you can't do it. So really what we do is uh, accept the complaints and do nothing because that's what everybody else does. But be aware that at least in principle, if you look hard enough, you're not supposed to do it. Uh, conflicts and self-reports. We left the world where there are no conflicts behind long ago. We can enforce hard conflicts through CMT, and we did. But we're full of squishy, soft conflicts. Everybody's written a paper with everybody else or borrowed somebody else's student or had a lift in their car or whatever. And that kind of conflict sometimes is a problem. So we thought, again, other strategies are available, but we thought we, we need to get people to self-report uncomfortable situations or potentially uncomfortable situations, even if they are comfortable dealing with them. And then we know that it's there and it's at least out in the open. It's probably the best you can do. There is no need to write papers for authors. I don't want to read to you all of these scripts, but we had a whole bunch of slides like this. And the slide essentially said, here is a situation that happens a lot. 
script. The referee and the AC reads the paper, sees ways in which the paper could be better, recommends changes, and then the authors refuse to adopt. Uh, suggested solution. I don't want to bind the ACs. The reason there were 108 smart people in the room is they're better at what they're doing than I am, and I trust their judgment. So I want to give them tools within which to operate and suggestions about how to operate, but I'm not saying you do this. Suggested solution. Author's problem. If it's not acceptable without changes, get rid of it. Theory. Why do we do it that way? You can't stop fools from being fools. It's not worth trying. If they don't want to put things in their paper that will make it better, that's their problem. They just didn't read the memo. <laughs> Similar arguments about extra experiments apply. Here's another script we went through. What do we do about anonymity and format violations? It's squishy. If it's really bad, desk reject. Otherwise, use your best judgment. Uh, secret data sets. Here is something that has happened several times, and it's a nuisance. A referee or AC rejects a paper as unscientific because it's evaluated in a data set that can't be, won't be, or hasn't been published. So it can't be replicated. Now, we have strong feelings about this issue in the community and strong feelings about openness, and we should. But we don't have a binding policy, and it's not fair for ACs to pull binding policies out of their ears. Right? So we know you can't do this because there isn't such a policy, and the theory here is you can't go inventing policies. Everybody needs to discuss and agree. Um, summaries and checklists. So there, are, there were about 3,000 summaries. In the olden days, PCs checked the summaries or didn't check the summaries or pretended to have checked the summaries or something. We couldn't even pretend. Nobody would have believed us. So we wrote a checklist. The key principle was, would a reasonable author object to the summary as a basis for the decision? Does the summary, and here's our checklist. Does the summary mention reviews or referees? Did the referees agree? If they agree, is it consistent with the consensus? If they disagree, was there a rebuttal? Does the summary mention it? Was there a discussion? Does it mention the discussion? Does the summary give the main points? Why did we do this? Because we had pairs of senior ACs and junior ACs. Senior ACs are sloppy because they've been doing it since 1953 or something and they know how it's done, they do it their way, and as a result, they write lousy summaries. Junior ACs do not want to challenge senior ACs because they're embarrassed. If a junior AC has a piece of paper that says it needs to meet these criteria, otherwise the program chair will throw a wobbly, they can challenge the senior AC. Furthermore, everybody's summary gets checked in a consistent way. Is this perfect? No. It is a good way to avoid unforced errors, and the errors that you make anyhow are quite enough. There is no reason to make extra errors through carelessness. Here are things you can't get away with. So a summary that says this sort of thing needs to be, has been done for years and needs to stop, which is a summary that I love to write, but I have too much of a conscience. A paper describes a method that has been known for a while. Majority of reviewers vote X, two of three view, reviewers vote reject, and there is a rebuttal, and I agree with majority. The borderline makes, I don't like the paper. <laughs> Why can you not get away with this? Because the checklist tells you it features that these kind of summaries are missing. Right? So I am propounding a view of bureaucratized reviewing that we are forced into by scale. When there were 350 of us and we all knew each other, we all knew standards of behavior and all that jazz. When there are 6,000 of us and hundreds of ACs, there is too much variance. We do need to impose this kind of bureaucracy. Okay, here is another fact, and I'll sort of close because I'm going on too long. Um, most people do not understand small sample effects. In a pool of 3,000 papers, if you get 30 of them, some of the people who get 30 of them are going to get really weird pools of papers. Uh, there is a recent textbook published by someone not a million miles away from here on probability and statistics for computer scientists that goes through all the simple procedures for working all this stuff out. But if you have 108 ACs and an accept rate of about 25%, we hit 30, but whatever, 25% is about right. About 70 of the ACs will accept somewhere between five and 10 papers in 30. But about 12 of them will accept 10 in 30 to 12 in 30. And about 12 of them will accept two in 30 to five in 30. The first group of 12 is panicking because they think they're too generous. The second group of, of 12 is panicking, panicking because they think they're too cranky. Nothing is going on. This is pure statistics, right? A few ACs will have accept rates greater than 0.4 or less than 
And these people are terrified because they think, you know, they're the sort of head meanie of CVPR because they're accepting nothing. But actually, they're just the lucky winner of a large variance effect. We have to be aware that in very large pools, variance does really funny things when you look at small samples. Okay, scale makes everything a lot harder. The weird stuff is very weird. We have to avoid unforced errors. We can make mistakes that we can't avoid, but we should not make the mistakes that we can avoid. Policy procedural frameworks. We need to recognize that almost everyone is doing whatever they're doing, X, for the first time, because there's so many new people. And that means we need to train them. They're trying to help, they're doing the right thing, they just may not be clear on how to. Finally, we need to inspire intellectually ambitious talent by expounding a coherent view of what we do. We do not spend our time dicking around with hyperparameters. When we do, we do it for a reason. Finally, watch everybody should be able to answer, what should I solve to get famous? We need aspirational problems, and that water right now is extremely murky. And I will leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. Questions? Do we have any questions? So with the growth that we've been having, reviewing has become a big issue. I am a grad student who reviewed 16 papers between CVPR and ECCV, sure. and I feel like I don't have the time to put the amount of work into those reviews that they actually deserve. Uh, how do we get more reviewers on board and spread the work out a little bit? Okay, so I think if we get more focused on training reviewers, our pool of reviewers will get bigger. So we have currently extremely shaky uh, approximate proxy metrics for selecting reviewers, right? Usually it's did your name appear as an author on a previous paper in these conferences, or are you on the sort of I got lucky list of emails that was inherited from the previous conference. That pool is probably too small. It's made smaller by the fact that there is an annoying tendency of people to want to write papers and not read them, right? That is widespread. Um, if we train people in reviewing practices, we can do our best to make it somewhat easier. There is, most of reviewing is routine work, right? The thing about routine work is with practice and with training, you can get quite efficient at it. So we can try to make it easier, and we can try to drag in people who have not reviewed before but are capable of writing reviews. There are a whole bunch of people out there who are perfectly capable of writing reviews but don't know how to do it and do not have access to someone else who will tell them. Right? It's the best I can suggest. Yes, we have a problem here, right? but we can at least ameliorate it. I don't have a magic bullet. Sorry, another question. So I want to know your, uh, your thoughts on publishing papers on archive, because sometimes these papers appear earlier before the submission, and uh, are you a fan of that, or what do you think? Um, okay, so I've been accused of all sorts of foolishness in the past 30 years, but nobody has suggested I'm stupid enough to tell everybody to stop publishing on archive. Um, <laughs> it isn't gonna happen. Okay. Uh, um, I think our community has accepted that publishing on archive is a reasonable way of communicating. Uh, the, and why would we stop the consensus of the community? Uh, we are building slowly best practices about how to review, how to deal with archive, how to ensure that archive isn't really used to bully uh, reviewers or to uh, intimidate reviewers into believing that, you know, the paper comes from a famous group, therefore it has to get in, or whatever. But, you know, I would say our best practices are still a little bit shaky. We're still figuring out how to deal with it, right? But the convention is that archive papers do not exist. What that means is you can't get dinged for not citing them, you can't get dinged for not comparing to them, and you can't, uh, uh, a an AC, or a referee should not uh, look at the archive paper and say, oh, good grief, the paper in front of me is by a famous group. I need to defer. Right? You could identify all sorts of holes in the convention, but it's the best we've got right now. Hi. What's your opinion 
on making reviews public? And why is this not something that we are doing already? Um, why is this so not something, let me answer in two parts. Why is this not something we are doing already? Because there is no strong consensus in the community to do it. Right? This is an extremely open and democratic community. It's done all sorts of things that I wish it hadn't done. It's not done all sorts of things that I wish it had done because the consensus of the community was to do or not do those things. Right? Um, there just isn't a consensus to open reviews. Myself, personally, I'm opposed to it. And the reason I'm opposed to it is I think basically too much energy gets sucked up into reviewers and authors slanging each other on the internet in, you know, basically you could find better things to do with life, like <laughs> sleeping or, you know, so I, I, but that's a personal point of view. Sorry. I, 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 but I didn't say anything to contradict that statement. So not everybody may have heard that. Uh, um, educating people about what a good review is probably requires showing them good reviews. That doesn't mean revealing reviews or allowing authors and referees to slang each other. Right? Uh, um, I, I agree with you on that point. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wonder about, it seems like a lot of things you learn as a grad student or as a young researcher, it's kind of ineffective means of kind of information trickling down on you on like how to be a reviewer, for example. Uh, would it be worth it for the community to sort of build like wikis, like online tools where everyone can contribute and everyone knows to turn to um, that would just really make it easier to get this information? Um, so let me see. Uh, I want to answer in two parts. One is, you know, I preemptively agree with you. I said it. We need training, we need regulation, and we need exposition. Right? We agree on that one. Do I believe that wikis to which everybody contributes are effective ways of achieving that? Mostly I do not. And the reason mostly I do not is they tend to end up situa in situations where either you have an overwhelming quantity of information where each new editor has uh, asserted the importance of the thing they did last year, and you know it, it doesn't make any sense at all, or people keep re-editing one another's contributions, or nobody notices, and none of those are good states. I think it probably is something where an editorial function needs to be uh, um, engaged in. Problem is, it's very difficult for the people who would naturally engage in that editorial function to do that, because they're spending an awful lot of time doing other stuff. But, you know, I think they should be doing this. So what's your opinion on the length of the review cycle right now? Do you think it's okay that it's nine months? Or is, do you think there's ways to accelerate it? And uh, okay. should we work on that? Um, I will give you Lord Salisbury's answer, which is I oppose all innovation because it may lead to catastrophe. <laughs> we have a system that was designed to handle about 300 papers per conference with about one and a half conferences a year. Right? It is now handling three to 4,000 papers a conference and who knows how many conferences a year. Even the tiniest error could bring on a catastrophe. We came eyelash close to a catastrophe in the CVPR and I'll describe it briefly. Um, and I think that is going to happen to other conferences. If we say, okay, we're going to reduce the review cycle to something we're not used to, we face all sorts of possibilities that might be frightening. For example, an effective strike by reviewers. What happens if we say, okay, look, you've only got a week to review the paper, and they say yes and don't do it? You see what I mean? We, we really need to be careful about innovation. Our catastrophe, I don't know if many conference committees will come forward and say what their near misses were, but every conference has a near miss. Ours was, we had a mix-up with the paper allocation to AC software, right? So we got the AC allocations out. The uh, uh, AC started allocating referees to papers, and the ACs looked at their paper titles and said, what the hell is going on, right? I, you know, I'm getting really funky papers. Not all of them did that because some of them got lucky. And it turned out what had happened was the TPMS had, for some 2,000 of 3,000 papers, looked at the first upload. Very often the first upload is a PDF version of the conference format, suggested format, 
just to make space, so that Toronto paper matching panicked and it just got assigned to a random AC. We then had to stop the review assignment paper, reassign papers to ACs without screwing up the good referee assignments. And we made it, to ha we made it happen by sheer energy, ignorance, and good luck, but it was very close. Right? That, things like that are signs of a system under breakdown through scale problems. Right? We had to allocate 500 emergency reviews. The last time I did this, there were 50 emergency reviews, and I dealt with it by phoning people up and threatening them. Even I cannot threaten 500 people over the telephone. <laughs> Even four of us could not threaten 500 people over the telephone, so very quickly we had to make it the AC's job, and the AC's responded magnificently. But you have to understand that we are really operating on the edge, and innovations like saying, look, we'll just push the cycle down a lot shorter are going to be very, very, very dangerous. This is, this is a great point to actually just transition into the panel so you can continue asking questions, not just to uh, David, but to everybody. So let's, we're going to thank David and then ask everybody else.